uh, Foundation Trust. I'm delighted um, to have so many governors joining me today um, and members of the public who may be watching this in the future. Um, we have quite a big agenda today as ever, so I will try and keep us um, to time and moving forward appropriately. We have some apologies for absence. Um, we have Roger Weddell, Phil Gilbert and Yasmin Becker having given them formal apologies. Um, Sarah Collette, are there any other apologies that you're aware of? Um, did, sorry, did you say Jane Knight? I was just checking the chorusy, but you did. Yet yeah, no more apologies and we are chorus. Okay, sorry, I didn't mention Jane Knight, but thank you, that's Sarah. So we're quiet, so we're ready to rock and roll. Thank you in particular to staff governors who are giving up um, their time today from their busy work. And it's great to welcome Bernard Osselman as uh, one of our new staff governors. Bernard, we greatly appreciate um, you joining us and giving up your time to be part of the staff side voice on the council. And it's also wonderful to welcome back Fiona Burton as our chief nurse officer. Um, Fiona, we've missed you and it's good to have you back. Um, but thanks again to Sarah Moffitt for all the work she's been doing whilst you've been on, on um, necessary leave. Have we any new declarations of qualification for office or declarations of interest? Could you please raise a digital hand if so? Uh, Sarah? Thank you, Russell. Um, the updated declaration of interest register is on the agenda today, but in addition to those listed, Pat Scott has submitted an updated declaration, um, which is that her grandson is a physiotherapist at the Trust and her daughter is a primary care network manager in Coventry. So just those additions to note, please. Super, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Pat. Um, any other points on that item? OK, we newly, duly move on then. So we've got the minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of February. If there are any points of accuracy on those minutes, could you please raise a digital hand? OK, I can't see any digital hands raised, so I'll take them as accurate and duly sign them off. So we then go to um, page uh, 20 of our pack for the um, action points uh, arising. Uh, the first was on the annual review of committee's terms of reference um, for the patient care committee for that to be amended um, and um, duly circulated. That was done, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, then we had the South Warwickshire place plan to be circulated to governors. I believe that was done by Anne. Thank you in absentia, Anne. Um, then on the Operational assurance report, the group research strategy to be circulated to governors, and I understand that was done as well. Um, then on the patient experience assurance report, a more detailed narrative provided in the next report about the type of subjects identified as other in the POWs section of the report. Um, so if you can pick that up, Fiona, going forward, so that would be great. Thank you. Then on the elective care group, details of the seven key risks referred to in the report be shared with the public governor, CH. I'm terrible sometimes on remembering everyone's. Um, so I'm just wondering who CH was. That's That's Kathy. Kathy. Thank Kathy. you. Kelly, thank you very much. Graham, were you able to do that? Yeah, I sent it to Cully, um, the actual risk report. OK, super. Like the little beard, uh, Graham, last time I saw it, I don't quite remember that, but pray you don't. It's a, it's a midlife, midlife crisis thing. I'm going to see if I can get it to Platt. <laughs> Good luck with that one. And then on the local quality indicator, um, I believe that was um, uh, discussed and um, is happening. And then finally, on the uh, General Purposes Committee draft minutes, uh, draft email to, for recruiting new members to be circulated to governors. And Mary, I think you did that. So, Yes, and we're waiting for further information when we've got the new membership and uh, engagement group set up to how we're going to progress those issues. Super. So are there any matters arising that colleagues feel we haven't covered? And can't see a digital hand, so I'll, I will move on. So 
Then on the so-called chairman's remark section, um, I've included um, an update on the last integrated care partnership, which I, I will take as read. Um, these meetings um, occur every three months and bring together a very broad church of partners across Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, a good level of debate. Um, I, I don't sit on the integrated care board, but I do sit on the integrated care partnership uh, committee. Um, and one of the key things to come out of that was that um, I am concerned that we need to ensure both that the integrated care partnership, the integrated care board and the SWIFT board, um, the patient voice sufficiently and citizens voice sufficiently loudly. So I have asked Chris Bain of Health Watch Warwickshire um, to on a, a, a regular basis come to the SWIFT uh, workshop board workshop to update us on issues which are a concern based on Health Watch's work for the citizens that we all serve. And Chris has agreed to do that. So um, thank you to Health Watch Warwickshire for supporting us in that. Um, any questions on the rest of that report, which I can help with, please raise a digital hand. OK, so on the basis I can't see any hands raised, I'll move on then to the uh, assurance item and uh, or assurance items. And the first are those um, governor requested assurance uh, issues. And I think the first, uh, Glenn, was uh, and it's over to you, but you're going to include the consequences of the junior doctors strike. So, Glenn, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Russell. What I was going to do is just a, a very brief operational update and also specifically talk about the impact of the strike. So I'll probably just do it in that order, which is if that's OK. So um, from a performance wise, it's been a really difficult period because of lots of things going on, including high levels of demand, but also the strikes, which I'll talk about in the moment. In fact, if you look at our demand, so last week was uh, we've had our highest number of a &E attendances ever. 298 so that's higher than we had in the kind of December peak uh, and I look back on too many years in the trust but I remember when I first came um, 150 was a, was a big number and now we're now we're going to go above 300 so and that's daily attendances in A&E and that's at a time when actually the, probably the acuity has got slightly higher as well because we're doing a lot of other things outside of hospitals so that continues to be challenging despite that um, we, we've we been performing well. Um, um, uh, a number of changes that were made to flow. We did a, um, some improvement work around the way our same day emergency care works. So year to date, we are just the right side of 80% uh, of A&E for our standard, which is which is considerably higher than, than, than most other trusts and exceeds the standard that we're supposed to get to by the end of the year, which is 76%. So long may that continue. Uh, elective activity continues to be good as well and protecting elective capacity. We delivered the 78 week waiting time challenge for the NHS at the end of the year. The NHS is now focused on 65 week maximum by the end of this year and we certainly see no reason at all why we shouldn't get to that. Um, we've also been invited to take part in an outpatient stretch exercise which is to see if some of those waiting lists that uh, are involved in outpatient activity, which is about 75% of the total waiting list is non-admitted pathways, uh, whether we could get there faster in terms of 52 week maximum. So we'll be hopefully getting some extra resources and help to do that over the summer. Um, and linked to that, obviously, our elective uh, hub work starts with the, the front door project. And if you hear any noise behind me, and if you've been on the site recently, you'll know there's quite a lot of enabling work started on that. And today, because it's Super Stats Day for the NHS, there's a bit of a feature. So our, our old friend Michaeli Padwano from BBC Midlands today has been on site doing a little piece about elective recovery, um, talking about the work that's going on here. So it should be positive, but you never can be too sure. Um, so that's all good. Um, surgical robot uh, arrived uh, a few weeks ago, which will um, initially be being used by the colorectal team, um, but will be supporting gynae as well and other specialties moving forward. 
Uh, and that's been quite an important thing to 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 implement at Warwick, particularly around recruitment and retention of surgeons and training of future surgeons. And I mentioned training yesterday. We had the official opening of Acorn House. I think Mary and, and, and I was there. Uh, I don't know other governors there, but I, I didn't look do a full look around the room. Um, but that was fantastic to see that facility coming to life. Um, and a great facility, but a really great team working in there, training um, all sorts of disciplines of staff. So that, that's great. And it's obviously a stone's throw away from the site, which is also good. At the start of the week, we had a group wide nursing conference as well in Bromsgrove, where representatives, uh, sorry, nursing and midwives conference, where representatives across the group talked about some of the improvement projects. Um, Jean was there for that. Um, and um, Russell and I had an opportunity to say a few words as part of it. That was a really great event um, and kind of demonstrated what we're all about as a group, which is sharing best practice at pace. Next week, we've got an improvement conference, which is a virtual event, uh, again, going on across the group. But one or two people have also asked if they can join that from national colleagues as well, because they're interested in what we're doing. All of that performance uh, stuff all wrapped up has left us in a situation where we're still in segment one, which is the, the best segment in terms of our overall performance. As yet, they haven't factored back in to that financial management, but they will be quite soon. So it's really important for us, uh, and Kim will give you an update on this later, really important for us to continue to be, to manage the resources in the way that we 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 have here and, and have a reputation to. Got a challenge this year in terms of our cost and productivity improvement plan, but it's really good that we're doing that through the lens of quality. So we're we're doing this Excel in Everything programme, which will deliver efficiency, but also make improvements to, to patient care. And we've had a couple of inspections over the last few weeks as well of maternity that you don't seem to get past uh, a, a month without another inspection of maternity services these days. So we've had an Ockenden review, which was a, a system and a regional inspection uh, and we've also had the CQC in to 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 look at our maternity service. Good feedback from both. Uh, we'll get a formal report back from the CQC, which we'll obviously share in our next public board meeting as soon as we've had it. Um, and then also celebrations are being uh, organised for the 75th birthday of the NHS in July. So we're, we're, we're starting to look at what we do there. And what we'll try and do there is, is look back on, on some of the innovations that we've implemented locally um, over over those many years uh, and also celebrate some of our staff that have been with us for a long time including a certain chief executive well we won't celebrate him but uh, I've been here for it'll be 40 years this year so um, so it's a 75 for the NHS 40 for me so and they and the NHS looks better than I do so let's just go back to the junior doctor strikes issue so um there's been a lot of focus nationally on cancellations, um, but what I've tried to encourage people to look at is, is, is the levels of activity that took place over, over those strike days, because a lot of organisations actually cancelled or didn't plan to do activity in advance. So, so you can only cancel something you plan to do, and, and many didn't plan to do it in the first place. But what I'm pleased to report from our perspective is through a, a, an awful lot of effort from lots of people we we cancelled very little and reduced our activity very little over those four days, which were really quite challenging. So we dropped around 176 outpatients, which over that period of days is, is quite a small number and certainly one of the smallest in the NHS. No inpatients were cancelled whatsoever. Uh, and we uh, and only six day cases were lost. And that was because of uh, consultants who visit us from UHCW not not being available during that period. Um, so how did we do that? We did that through a, an awful lot of planning and coordination through consultants working really hard um, and um, dropping some of their other activities to be on the front line. Um, and other disciplines like advanced clinical practitioners um, and, and everyone pulling um, hard in the right, same direction to to deliver that. So. Um, but I wouldn't want to give the impression that it was easy. So um, I, I did actually visit the picket line that was outside my office. Um, and um, I think one thing uh, and talking to them, they're quite resolute about the need to address resource issues. It's you know, this is obviously a little bit more than just a pay dispute. Um, 
but it's not you know this isn't a dispute between us and our workforce this is a, a national issue and so that's why i was keen to ensure that we uh got back to business and work with each other moving forward which is what we've been able to do um there is a uh the mandate exists until august for further strike action at the moment junior doctors have not indicated any further dates but there still is a risk that there could be coordinated action with uh, what could still be a potential nursing strike so the royal college of nursing are are voting again at the end of this month to consider whether they should take out further action and you'll be aware that some of the other unions have uh, agreed to the pay rise such that it is actually going to be enacted so the government are saying June but they've not given us the details of it yet but June July time we will be making the award to all of those agenda for change staff groups um, even though the RCN have not um, uh, supported that uh, payment yet um, and so we we obviously wait to see what happens with uh, those national discussions I think the biggest concern for me is the over the last three years we've been uh, on a kind of um, a, 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 an incident footing for, for too too long. And so the amount of management headroom and capacity that goes into planning for responding to strikes is, is significant. And it, it stops us doing some of the other things that we want to be doing, you know, improving services, delivering some of those improvements I've already touched upon. So the sooner we, we, we can clear the way, get that headroom back, uh, the better. So, um, so hopefully, Russell, that, that touched on what the governor's wanted me to touch on. I'm happy to take any questions. No, thank you, Glenn. I mean, we are still um, recovering, I think it's fair to say, from the challenges of the winter, COVID, and as you say, the, the different disruptions that we've had. And whilst our performance isn't quite what, what isn't where it was um, in 2019, I think our Journey of improvement is faster than others. Um, so um, I would just like, before I invite governors for questions, um, to, to thank the, the executive directors and all of our frontline teams for the work they do day in, day out under very uh, stressful circumstances. And as Glenn indicated, at a time where there is real anxiety in terms of cost of living and the practicalities of life. So thank you. Uh, questions and perspectives to Glenn. Could you please raise a digital hand? Uh, Bernard? Uh, yeah, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? We yeah, marvellous. Thank, thank you. So, Glenn, um, as you know, we're somewhat reluctant in the medical profession to call it a junior doctor strike because some of the people on strike were actually fairly senior, well qualified, well experienced, and uh, propping up the NHS left, right and centre, as you might expect. But my question is about future strike action. I mean, as far as you can t read the runes, what do you think the likelihood of a consultant strike might be over the next six months going forward? Well, well Bernard, I'm, I'm, I might ask you that question. But uh, yeah, as you're aware, the, the, the BMA is, uh, is, has put out, is putting out a vote to its members about whether okay. consultants should take action. Um, I, I think one of the issues that was has been quite rightly concerning consultants has been some of the pension flexibility, the lifetime allowance arrangements, uh, and it was pleasing to see some resolution to that within the last budget. So I think that's one issue that that might well help the mood. Um, but. I, I think the concern, as you say, from junior doctors and, and, the, and these are senior doctors, uh, these are some very senior clinicians, the concern from, from them is kind of wider than just their own pay. It is about the workforce gaps and the pressures within the NHS. And one thing that we've not seen yet, um, and uh, I hope we see very soon, is the national workforce strategy. And what I would hope is that if we can get that out soon and it has the right elements of it, including training more doctors and resourcing that appropriately that it might uh, it might give us some more guarantees that the appropriate resources are going into this because it is it, it is about some of the pressure that, that some of those individuals are under that that is that is leading to this um, and um, uh, 
uh, yeah, I hope there's a resolution. I hope we get to a position where the resources are there and and, and we can move forward positively. So, but um, don't ask me uh, to give a percentage on my confidence on that one, please, Bernard. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn and Sue. Oh, yes, a couple of things. Thank you um, very much for Acorn House. I was going to say it is a lovely place, um, but thank you on behalf of the community staff based at Cape Road who now have a nice, nice, beautiful offices to, to be in, both the district nurses and the therapy staff and health visitors. But thank you for that. And the other thing very briefly is, is from an RCN perspective, I'm glad you, you realised that obviously it's not a, a protest to, against the trust. We have no co conflict with the trust at all. This is a national issue. And, oh, yes, it is it's to do with pay to a slight extent, no, probably more than that, actually. But unless we get a decent salary for nurses, we're not going to be able to get the nurses into the profession. And what we're fighting for is, is safe, safe staffing levels. Yeah, I, I completely I completely understand that. And, and and so actually one of the things I think needs to be considered in all of this is that the headline pay rate, uh, if it does address the recruitment and, tension and retention issue, will not be as high as it looks because obviously the, the use of agency staff is, 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 is a problem right across the NHS. So if we can do something that, that slows that down or reverses that, then it actually will save us some money. So so I think that needs to be taken account of. And and as for the yeah, the the we the, the district nursing, the community staff that are that are based within Acorn House. I visited them in the height of last summer when it was really hot and they'd got a lovely air conditioned office which was so tempting to stay in there. But it was such a great facility compared to where they were before. So I'm glad that that's been well received by them. Thank you. And any other questions or perspectives? I think, um, Glenn, just uh, going back to what you uh, refer to regarding the building works outside, I, I would just like to uh, say to members of the public, uh, patients, their families and loved ones visiting the site, um, this uh, summer in particular and this year is going to be even more difficult in terms of car park logistics um, because of the uh, fantastic building work that's going on to redevelop the site. So we do apologise in advance. Um, everyone who visits the sites knows the practical challenges of finding a, a car parking space. So all we can do is to get the work done as quickly as possible um, and apologise to patients, families and loved ones, as well as members of staff um, in the meanwhile. Um, we'll move on then to the patient experience assurance report. And Fiona, welcome back. Over to you. Thank you, thank you. So this report is um, a um, summary of uh, the uh, quarter. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Information uh, related to the last quarter. So um, in summary, for the members of the public, I think the governors um, hear this on a regular basis. So uh, so should um, uh, so should be no surprises to you. So, so in that quarter, the number of complaints and concerns remained low com compared to the activity um, uh, in uh, the, the rest of the trust. FFP test results have re remained high in terms of the uh, friends and family test uh, um, reports. Uh, of uh, patients receiving good care and um, uh, and um, there's a number of initiatives re um, included in the report in terms of things that we've done um, differently. So one of those is a health passport for patients with learning dis um, dif uh, disability. Um, we've updated that in relation to including some of more personalised care um, um, uh, needs that they may need. Um, we've um, uh, um, we've updated a, a, a hospital leaflet so they understand how to access um, the internet and and uh, video connections to that. Um, and um, we've um, implemented some um, smiley face cards as a, a different approach to gathering uh, patient uh, feedback, particularly in um, uh, our children in care team. 
Um, we work closely and I was uh, glad to hear that Health Watch is coming um, on a regular basis to our board workshop because we are uh, building and continuing to build relationships with Health Watch so we understand more broadly what um, the feedback is from our, our public. Um, and um, in terms of concerns, we still continue to um, uh, put um, some focus on um, improving the feedback um, and the rate uh, of response for um, friends and family, uh, particularly the number of uh, responses that we get um, through A&E. Um, and we're um, taking a number of actions to, to improve that. Um, and we, have, we do have um, some concern about uh, the response rate um, and the timeliness of that from our emergency division. But as you can, you could you could probably appreciate, um, given the pressures operationally, um, that that is a sort of balance of risk of how quickly we can respond uh, based on the busyness of the hospital. Um, but again, um, the emergency division has have appointed some senior leaders in in their um, division recently, and we're hoping that that will improve um, that response rate. Um, apart from that, I'm happy to take any questions from governors on any aspect of the report that's been circulated to you. That's great. Thank you, Fiona. And as I said, welcome back. Any questions or perspectives to Fiona? OK, so thank you. Um, I've been reminded I, I uh, in his eloquence and straight um, forward manner, I bow to allow Glenn to cover off the quality assurance report. So we'll just pop back for a second. Um, and Glenn, on the quality assurance report, was there anything you particularly wanted to pull out? Yes, so, so the, this is the quarterly status report of the performance against the trust objectives. And those of you who follow the board meeting will have seen this anyway because it went to a recent board meeting, but it this will feature in the annual report and it closes down the objectives that were set for last year. So the next time you see this, it will be looking at this year's objectives. Um, and as usual, there's a rag rating of whether we've delivered or, or whether there's more work in progress on them. The only thing I just wanted to point to, which is the, is the kind of red rated area, which is making more progress on the lead provider responsibilities linked to the integrated care board arrangements. Um, We've red rated it because we were keen to go faster than we have. The thing that will help us with this is that we are a provider collaborative innovator site uh, and, and they will be helping us and the system nationally to, 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 to move that forward and to get around some of the, the hurdles, either real or perceived, that, that have slowed us down so far. So that's the, that's the only thing I wanted to, to just flag. Otherwise, um, some really good progress on lots of things, including quality initiatives like the autism strategy, like the cancer care navigators. Um, uh, and so I'm happy to take any questions if there are any, Russell. Yeah, great. Thank you, Glenn. Any questions to Glenn on, on those areas of assurance? I think one of the other things, which obviously isn't on that list, is uh, again for members of the public, we are doing some really great work in terms of driving to net zero. and um, we have been successful with our SADEX uh, proposal, which means that um, by the end of next year, 80% um, uh, will be 80% towards being net zero on the Warwick side, um, which is a quite remarkable result. Um, and uh, well done to all of the estates team for their development in that regard. Uh, we'll therefore move on to the clinical governance assurance report and uh, David Spraggard, who chairs our Clinical Governance Committee. David, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll, the, these are the reports for three meetings that, because of uh, various reasons, um, uh, have all come to this for this particular meeting. Uh, the one thing I would like to point out is the January meeting was considerably abridged because of the operational pressures that were in the system in the hospital. So a lot of clinicians weren't invited to attend. Uh, so there was a, a number of reports were read but not actually discussed. Um, I think I don't wish to go into any great detail other than what's actually in the report and I'm happy to answer any questions people have. 
Um, David, just because I think it might be uh, of interest uh, generally to members of the public, yep. both you and I are um, champions for maternity services. Yes. Um, um, and we've recently had a CQC visit. Um, yeah. Based on your independent uh, view, yeah. how do you see um, that having gone and the level of assurance you have over our maternity? Right. Services? I mean, I have, I have to say it was discussed um, at the clinical governments meeting as in yesterday. So, of course, that hasn't yet gone to board. So it'll be at the next council of governors meeting that. But actually, the, the gut feeling is it went really well. Um, and I think the uh, the staff actually had a real a, a positive experience about something that was quite stressful, I think, for them. Um, <clears throat> and the feedback that we received, and it is only initial feedback, I think it'll probably be a number of weeks before we get the formal report. But uh, the initial feedback was was almost all positive. They did make um, some recommendations, which the team are already addressing. So. I think that we we should take some comfort, um, and certainly compared to some of the reports that have been for other hospitals in the country, because of course CQC are visiting all maternity units in the country. Um, I'm quite confident we will not be in the bottom uh, third of that particular league table. Thank you, David. Um, so, any questions to David as chair of clinical governance on? his reports and clinical governance matters generally. Please raise a digital hand. Uh, Mary? Uh, yes, David, is, is there any update on the situation with the mortality data? Um, yes, the, there is. The uh, Again, this is something that was discussed yesterday. Um, and so I think that the, the at the, the, the clinical governance meeting before last, Charles gave a, a very in-depth discussion about the various mortality indicators and explained some of the difficulties of interpreting uh, them because, of course, they're all looking backwards. They're not looking forwards and they're certainly not real time. Um, and of course, the, the we, we have heard, I have heard that the most recent shimmy has reduced, has gone down. So there has been some work in, that has happened over the last couple of three months, um, which we were anticipating was going to make a difference in a few months time because of the nature of shimmy in particular. But it's hopeful that there has been a modest improvement already, which is possibly earlier than we might be expecting from the interventions. Okay. I don't know if that, does that answer your question, Mary? Yes, it's heading in the right direction. It's, head, it's heading in the right. I mean, I, it's, it's certainly not as uh, the level it was two years ago, but um, it's, it's stopped going up. It's probably the most important uh, thing. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, David and Ruth. I'm just um, adding on to this, which is a bit cruel, really. But I, <laughs> because there's an increase in mortality, I read that there was congestion in the mortuary. And um, that sounds a bit horrible that um, they were having a bit of um, a bit of a problem there. I right. don't know if anybody that, has that, it. that that uh, mortuary issues have not been raised at clinical governance, to be perfectly honest. Um, I don't know. Glenn, Glenn's got his hand up. I think he might know more about it than me. Yeah, and in that in the height of the winter with the flu and COVID, uh, and let's not forget we had the biggest wave of COVID in in, in that period. Uh, pretty much all NHS mortuaries were were full, um, and um, and and we therefore exercised contingency plans around using space in in local funeral directors etc. to 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 minimise that. So yeah, I mean that was a that was a, an issue, but we 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 balanced it well and worked well across the system to address that that issue. And some of it was a little bit related to delays in funeral arrangements over bank holidays when you when you have that that period as well so uh, yes that was an issue but it's certainly not an issue at the moment is there any plan to um replace the mortuary with a more up-to-date building when we're doing the refurbishments uh the, the currently isn't i mean there, there is, we are spending some money in there but uh, it probably would take me to the kind of wider point about access to capital and prioritization of, of of capital and and at the moment even though we talked about the building works going on outside my office we the next 
big priority for us would to be make sure that we 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 do resource the full theatre replacement programme. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Mary. Um, David, I guess a question for me. Um, clearly for our citizens, uh, fast turnarounds of cancer tests, diagnosis and um, uh, services is, is a disproportionate area of anxiety. Yeah. Um, how are you seeing our cancer services at the moment, particularly as we rely on partner organisations for the provision of much of our cancer capability. Yeah, I think I think the the, the biggest issue we are having hitting uh, the targets we'd like to achieve is third party issues rather than uh, swift issues themselves. Uh, the that you're quite right that uh, we are constrained because you know we aren't a tertiary unit and many aspects of cancer services do involve even if it's only briefly tertiary services. And so we do rely on colleagues in other hospitals to provide a, an adequate service. Um, in terms of the diagnostics, we do provide most of the diagnostics uh, ourselves, but there are again, some specialized diagnostics that require tertiary expertise. So um, I think that uh, as far as I'm aware, the the uh, service level agreements that, that we've got with tertiary units for this, um, are being looked at carefully and um, discussed. Um, I, I'm not the right person to ask about that bit. Yeah, I think though, just in terms of um, making sure that uh, as uh, chair of clinical governance, you're feeling comfortable going forward. Yeah. So, so, if you like, executive conversations develop. I think is important. Yeah. And, uh, I yeah. I, th I think I think you're quite right. I think the, the, we're we're going definitely in the right direction. That's uh, again, but but as with many things, because we aspire to be, we, we never we realise we're never going we're never going to uh, achieve exactly what we want to aspire to because we're always aspiring to be better. And I think that um, you know we're we're going in the right direction. Thank you, David. And finally, Roger. Then we'll move on. Thank you. Um, on the the question of um ra radiology results is the uh, is the scope for us to do more with ai internally to um, r reduce our reliance on our partner organizations david would you like glenn to answer that i would love glenn to answer it because the I, i'm unaware of the answer <laughs> but glenn what would your view on Rogers? Um, and, and the and the answer is yes. Um, so we be we have been looking at some AI linked to to radiology, uh, and we're doing a little bit of a trial at, in George Eliot on that at the moment, which will learn the learning from which will be shared across the group. There's, yeah, there's a, there's a there's a there's an opportunity to to filter um, plain film Im images, particularly through through AI, so that the consultants look at the things they need to look at. Um, and that looks to be uh, going quite well. So yes, that will that will definitely help, Roger. Thank What's you. This space, I think, Roger and colleagues. Okay, if we're um, uh, feeling comfortable, we'll move on then to the finance assurance support. And uh, Kim, over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. So, so this is the outturn report for the last financial year, and uh, pleased to report that we delivered a small surplus of seventy nine pounds. Uh, which uh, is in line with the forecast that I've been uh, presenting for the last uh, few uh, months. Uh, we have now submitted our accounts, which we submitted on time, and our auditors are, uh, you know, have been on site now for the last couple of weeks and had an update meeting with them earlier. And the audit seems to be progressing uh, uh, on, on target, so, so that's uh, good news. Uh, pleasing to see as well in terms of the month um, trial position. That we, we, you know, the the the, the percentage uh, in terms of our agency spend as a proportion of a substantive staff is reducing, and early indications as well for our month one position also indicates that our run rate on it, uh, on agency seems to be heading in the right right direction, which is uh, uh, which is which appears to be positive uh, news. Uh, in terms of capital, we did spend uh, forty two million uh, pounds on capital. A significant amount of spend in the last uh, month as a forecast. Uh, uh, a big chunk of that, uh, 26 million, 
uh, related to the uh, uh, shares that we bought in Innovate uh, as part of a significant transaction that we sought uh, approval from uh, the Council of Governors uh, last uh, at the last meeting. Uh, the uh, Council of Governors had uh, gave, given us approval to purchase up to 22 million, uh, but uh, also gave delegated authority to Glenn and myself to agree the final amount, uh, which out turned at 26 million. And we also uh, sought a board uh, ratification of that sum as well. Uh, so, so that was all uh, done uh, and, and agreed. Uh, the focus now really is moving towards next year. And uh, we've got obviously uh, my next papers around our Excel and everything board. Uh, we have, we've, we've been doing a lot of to and uh, from an ICB perspective around agreeing the actual plan for a new financial year. And we have negotiated the plan, which is a break even plan for, for the trust, uh, but uh, that, that requires us to deliver a 20 million pound cost improvement uh, program, of which uh, we uh, managed to uh, reduce down to 14 and a half million, which uh, I believe is much more manageable as an organization. Uh, but I'll pick up uh, the uh, on the next paper uh, around it, uh, what we're doing around our approach to CIP in a minute. So if I take any questions really uh, around the finance assurance paper now. Thank you, Kim. Any questions or perspectives to Kim? A nice uh, comment in the chat box from Mike. Thank you, Mike. OK, I can't see any hands raised. We'll move on then to the approach to the year ahead, particularly on CPIP, the cost and productivity improvement progress. Um, uh, over to you, Kim. Thank you. So, so cost improvement um, is always a challenge for any organisation. And we've kind of, um, over the, you know, the last year or so, we've kind of been brainstorming really a different approach really to truly get the organization engaged in uh, in, in our in our approach and as glenn alluded to we wanted to make sure really that we uh, ensure that we balance the quality uh, quality aspect as well as the operational delivery as well as the productivity and then delivering on the financials so uh, between us we've come up with a program uh, on our cost of productivity improvement program, but we're going to we've called it we've branded it, shall we say, Excel in 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 everything, and it's really pleasing really to hear that there is really good engagement both uh, culturally and um, you know uh, as well as you know um, just general engagement really in the whole program. So we've um, so Sarah Moppet, who 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 obviously was the interim uh, chief uh, nurse. Uh, is staying on to support us and she's leading uh, the programme as our Director of Recovery and Care Excellence. Uh, uh, and that's uh, that's been, it's really good actually to have uh, Sarah on board to be able to keep oversight and work with the executive team to ensure uh, de delivery. So I won't go through the, the detail, uh, it, it, you know, you've got the paper there. So it's supported by our, our programme, uh, our Project Management Office. And uh, we've got a number of key work streams, uh, which I've set out in the paper. And uh, we've also, in addition, set some stretch uh, targets around agency reductions as well for the division. And we've got uh, as a uh, senior responsible officer leads for all of those programs of work um, and bringing it together and having a regular uh, dialogue. The, the governance for those meetings that we have, this, uh, we have a, a board uh, which reports through to our management board. Uh, I will obviously bring a summary in terms of uh, how we're doing as part of my financial assurance uh, paper, and uh, we will also uh, ensure that the, um, the the governance is met through our finance and performance executive as well to ensure that the bottom line cash is coming out as well to ensure that we deliver our financial responsibilities as well to deliver our uh, break even plan. Here. So happy to take questions. No, thank you, Kim. And at our three uh, board meetings um, from the foundation group um, last time, we did talk about the opportunities across the group and within each of the individual organisations about really driving productivity and cost improvement. And there are still big numbers for us to go after. So I think it's excellent um, that uh, Sarah's staying with us to help you 
drive this program and it to be a truly bottom up approach to accountability and delivery of, of better performance. So um, thank you, Kim. Uh, questions and perspectives to Kim? Uh, th this work is um, uh, disproportionately important um, for us to ensure that we are driving the, the performance, the machine of SWIFT as hard as we can do. So uh, we will keep you fully briefed on it. Um, it's great that we do have that combination of Kim and Sarah involved in ensuring at board level that um, the work is successful, but we will keep governors and um, members of the public um, uh, briefed as things develop. Um, so we'll then move on to the, all oh, sorry, Mary. Uh, sorry, Chair, I just, I, I can't fully understand how we got the, from the 20 million to the 14.5 million. Um, I can't look at the paper, it doesn't look clear to me how we managed to do that. It's great. But... Yes, yeah, great if I didn't articulate it well yeah. enough. Right. So, so at the uh, beginning of the year, we, always, we, we, we have discussions with the, um, with the divisions around cost pressures that we will fund or not fund. You know, so I have to make some high level estimates at a point in time, uh, which is where I got the original sort of gap of 20 million pounds. But as, uh, as we've progressed those discussions, I was able to close that gap down to 14 and a half million pounds. So apologies if I didn't articulate that well enough. Thank you. Um, and then, as ever, uh, Mary, there is a degree of jiggery pokery when it comes to um, the way money's flow within the system. Um, and so part of the reason Kim was able to do that was part of the jiggery pokery which I think is a technical um, financial term um, used by people of a certain ilk. Um, Mike. Jiggery pokery indeed. Um, I read the paper to suggest that the agency reduction target was separate to the 14 million target and therefore you made the 20 million up that way. Is that correct? Uh, not, no, so the, the, the agency reduction is separate because agency, we don't fund on agency. So from a budget perspective, uh, we, we don't budget on agency expenditure. So any agency spend is deemed as a premium and contributes to an overspend petition. So therefore, in order to ensure that we're not overspending, I've set very clear agency reduction targets for the divisions to equally make sure that they're managing within their means. So that's a reduction to spending and not to budgets. Correct. Okay, Correct. thanks. Really clear. Thank you. Now, one of the things that's concerned us in some other people's numbers, Mike, is they're regarding a reduction in agency as um, part of their cost improvement programme, whereas in reality, it's just not spending money they're not able to spend anyway. So we've tried to be very clear and transparent on this. Well, <clears> some, <throat> some budget for their agency spend, of course. So a reduction in it would be a, a saving on budgets, but I know we don't. OK, so colleagues happy to move on to the audit assurance report from Richard. So Richard, over to you, please. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think there's two uh, audit committees. Uh, I think the 14th of December, 8th of February, but they were considered by the boards on 1st of March and the 5th of April. I think a lot of the points I've raised, I think I've discussed with governors in various other meetings. The three areas that were really of concern, one was the fact that uh, we're slightly behind with the, the uh, managing of conflicts, interests and gifts. But that's because we uh, put that online with the HR system, so we'll actually get better enforceability. So that's probably put back to April. Um, we had some more delays on some of the satellite accounts like uh, charitable funds and SWIFT clinical services, but I can confirm to the governors that they've all now been filed. And I have raised with you that, that like a lot of places post COVID, there has been an increase in violence and bad behaviour and swearing, uh, almost up about 80% to pre-pandemic uh, and there are mitigations being put in place there. I think it's common across most industry. People are frustrated post-pandemic and not very tolerant, but uh, there's an awful lot gone into there. Happy to take it, take the ports as read. Any questions? Yeah, 
Thank you, Richard. Any questions or perspectives? Uh, Roger? Yes, Richard. I, are the external auditors going to be able to deliver uh, in a in a more um, beneficial time frame that, uh, by comparison with last last year's efforts, which frankly was a bit disastrous? I think it was disastrous for two reasons last year. One was that there was illness and two, when they brought additional staff in, their staff weren't at the sufficient quality level to deal with it. Um, what, a couple of things, we've had a, a, a very good debrief between them and the accounts team and also this time uh, we, we've put a lot more controls around the questions being raised uh, by them and making sure we're squaring off and I'm sure Kim's going to jump in and just say it's all progressive because they've had the numbers and I think Kim said earlier uh, they've had the accounts probably about 10 days now and there's nothing that really causes significant problems so Kim. Yeah thank you just to give you a bit of further assurance Roger you know we I have a weekly meeting with their partner uh, as well to make sure we're on track we had a formal kickoff meeting uh, earlier today to ensure that uh, the work has been fairly distributed amongst my finance team so it's not um, held up with one individual and uh, we've also talked about early escalation if they're not uh, there's a strict timetable in terms of what they want uh, and what we have to upload in terms of their electronic portal and we are actively monitoring to ensure that we're uh, submitting information on time but equally if they're, they're not available then we have dialogue around reprioritizing that work to ensure that there is no dead time really uh, I think bet between uh, both uh, from their perspective as well as our perspective so but uh, said so I've got weekly monitoring uh, to ensure that we're, we're on, on, on top of it and where they have got gaps, uh, they are bringing in more senior people as well. So we're not in the situation that we were facing last year. Excellent. Well done. And any other questions or perspectives to Richard? I guess I'd just like to go back on this issue of uh, verbal abuse, um, uh, uh, just to make it clear. Uh, the absolute essence of our culture is to be kind and be polite. And we expect colleagues to be kind and to be polite to one another. Um, but we also expect members of the public, their families, anyone visiting the site to be kind and be polite. Everyone is working in a very stressful situation. We appreciate visiting a hospital, uh, particularly if uh, you're visiting a loved one, can be extremely stressful. But being kind and being polite is a basic um, requirement of you being uh, welcome um, on the site. So we would encourage everyone to be kind and be polite, both staff and um, uh, patients and their families. Um, Andy Petros. Um, thanks, Russell. On that on that very point, I'm just interested. Have we had any incidents of of, of bad uh, behaviour, swear, swearing, and 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 if so, what are the what what are the um, plans uh, or methods to uh, stop that? I, do we do we have a warning system? Do we uh, how do we escalate it? The, um, I think quite I'm a lot of investment's going... gone in. Shall I say that, Russell? We just go through because we went through it in depth, trying to support the the security and parking manager looks after. There's been another six cameras put into the emergency department, and key staff in the emergency department now have cameras and recording devices because we found and one of the problems we had was that we could record what was going on, but the physically the actual verbal abuse wasn't heard so that's now gone in and uh staff are now uh, sorry people who are abusive uh sanction letters are raised uh, on, on via datix so uh and, and we've also got more support to staff uh who've had that harassment so it's i just think it's a it's it's a feature of post pandemic that p the life is different yeah, the standards shouldn't be. I agree with that, Richard. Um, but about 20 to 25 percent of our staff report having been abused by uh, members of the public in the last year, Andy. Um, Glenn, anything you'd like to add? 
Yeah, I mean, Richard said it there actually, but but just to reassure Andy, the the uh, there is a what we call a yellow card and red card system that 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 is in operation. Obviously, it's a last resort, but we will occasionally uh, withdraw treatment or arrange for a, a, a patient to to go to another provider if they've been particularly abusive or violent towards any of our staff, and we obviously work closely with the police on that as well if we need to. Thank you. Very reassuring. It happens more frequently, Andy, than you would think. And um, even if it would only happen once, it's unacceptable. But it happens a surprising amount. And I think it is, um, people can talk about it being a post-pandemic um, situation. Uh, for me, it's just about politeness, kindness, common decency, um, appropriate values for when people are doing their absolute best to look after you. And I'd just add to that, Russell, that part of the reason I'm raising it with the board and the governor is to make sure staff are aware that we all take this very seriously. Thank you, Richard. Um, so uh, we'll move on then to the reports and representatives on projects and groups. Um, and first up is the Ellen Badger Hospital site redevelopment. Um, Mike. Thank you, Russell. So the paper was written a few weeks ago, um, but I'll take it as read. I did say that I'd provide a verbal update from yesterday's project board. And the interesting things of note were that stage four, which is the detailed design plans, are now with the builders. Ground stabilization equipment, um, which I'm sure is the sort of noisy stuff Glenn's hearing, uh, is arriving soon. And we've got a planned start date this month. Um, there was a meeting on site on the 27th with uh, various trust departments where prospective teams came to look at the retained building, which if you're standing on the road looking at it is on the left hand side, um, with a view to returning services while the actual building of the new section is, is going on. Uh, and it's planned to have a schedule of clinics available for the project board in July, so that's two months away. So hopefully by the time we get to September, we'll know what's going on and be able to say, uh, what, what services will be back there. Um, an interesting challenge at the moment is Warwickshire County Council uh, and the access to the site, which is going to be at the opposite end, so a whole new sort of entrance, has to be built by their preferred contractor, uh, which I think is Balfour BT. So there's lots of liaison going on to make sure there's no delays on that at the moment. Um, and the other point of note really is um, the Star Health and Wellbeing Partnership are making excellent uh, progress with Muna Chan, who's the trust's fundraising lead. Um, and she's already helped them get some new bids in um, for extra funding for the activities that are starting now, but will become the activities in the Health and Wellbeing Hub. Happy thank to take Mike. questions. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for your hard work on that. And um, so questions and perspectives, uh, John Holland. John, if you're speaking, we so, can't hear you. Sorry, I'm in trouble getting my microphone on, but yeah, you know, just declaring an interest as the local county councillor. So I'm here to help. You know, if you, 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 there will be problems. The county highways are very, very short staffed because the private sector is paying a lot more for the same type of work. And right. inevitably, there's a lot of things which should be done quickly and not being done quickly. But that's no excuse. You know, we need it done. So please give me a ring if I can be of any assistance. Sure, I'll pass that offer on to Sophie. Um, I think she was going to write to the uh, appropriate person. It's all to do with the Section 278 stuff. So. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, and Mike Lexman? Yeah, we, we, sorry, we had about a, a six-month delay getting the Zebra Crossing in in Miller's Road, but we got there in the end. Yeah, we remember, John. Hi. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's the right place to ask the question, but Stratford District Council Community Infrastructure Levy, 1.4 million for the scheme. Where Where is that going to end up supporting? Glenn? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's probably, probably a more, more detailed question than we've probably got time to answer, but but Fundamentally, we are still trying to ensure that we can deliver an integrated 
primary care offer as well as the redeveloped hospital on that site so so it would be a contribution towards that that wider scheme but there are still affordability issues for the primary care element so i think it is it, that continues to 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 evolve in the background it, it could significantly reduce the notional rent problems for the gp practice if it subsidized their part of the capital build question mark yeah, but there, there are then issues about um, subsidising of what is a, a private business. So we, we just need to, to make sure that we, we it, it pays appropriately for the right public benefit. I've seen it used before elsewhere for that, but, you know, I'll leave that one with you. I'm sure you'll sort that one out. I mean, it is worth remembering that um, uh, primary care GPs are, are private businesses and any capital gain on property that they um, uh, are uh, involved with um, any capital gain goes to the partners. It doesn't come back to the NHS, which is where we have to be very careful on this. Um, mm. If there are no other points to Mike, um, with thanks to Mike for your ongoing involvement, we'll move then to the end of life committee um, update. And Mike, mm. over to you. Well, I, I have prepared a report which everybody's got. Uh, I don't propose to go through that other than to say that it is clear from that report, I hope, that there are progress being made in various aspects, uh, particularly three objects which uh, the uh, End of Life Committee is looking to improve in the coming year. And I was also pleased to see as the ex-coroner of Warwickshire that Dr Raj Poor has been appointed as a medical examiner because I retired as coroner some 15, 16 years ago, and we were talking about the appointment of medical examiners then, and, that, and it's very pleased to see that they've actually arrived. They are going to be a very good idea insofar as his job will be to oversee all deaths, uh, more or less regardless, as, as against the coroner, and to uh, see perhaps if we have, a, amongst other things, a Dr Shipman. We certainly hope that's not the case, Michael, but point to, to, uh, understood. Um, questions and perspectives to uh, Michael on the end of life committee update. I, I would like just to again put on public record, we are uh, and we have invested in a really high quality palliative care uh, team. Um, we have, I think, two palliative care consultants um, and they do absolutely outstanding work, the whole of the team, on, on what is very stressful work. Um, I am conscious of the fact that sickness levels amongst our team has been higher uh, recently than is ideal due to some long term uh, sickness issues. So I would just like to thank all of the team uh, for their continued efforts day in, day out to help uh, people at the end of life and families coping. Um, with the knowledge the loved ones are at the end of life. You do a great job. Uh, we're very proud of you and thank you very much. Could I, could I add there, Russell, as an observer uh, watching professionals, that um, I've been impressed every time with the enthusiasm there is to actually make a good result for as many people as possible in those circumstances. Well, well said, Michael. As, as I often say, Paul, the two most important things we do are um, bring life, or should be, bring life safely into the world and help life leave the world with dignity. And at the nursing conference that we had um, on Tuesday, which both Fiona and I and Glenn uh, attended, and Jean was there as well, it was great to see some of the celebrations of the type of work we do in, in the end of life area. Um, and uh, so finally, Mary, then we'll move on. Um, yes, Michael, um, did you make any mention about um, supply of end of life medication in the community? Uh, do you, that was that was an ongoing issue for some time. I don't know whether that's resolved or if it hasn't, perhaps that's something you could raise at a future meeting. Um, Emma, do you want to come in on that just for a second? Absolutely. The um, urgent response community teams are working on this at the moment one of the ACPs is championing it that um, they will hold 
um, a bag of various drugs, including end of life drugs that will be then available so that if somebody needed antibiotics, end of life drugs on a Saturday on a bank holiday, they wouldn't have to be looking for a pharmacy. They'd be there ready to go. So that is a project that's been worked on. And it's hopefully near to resolution and implementation. That wouldn't be allowed for the controlled dogs, so would it, Emma? Uh, yeah, they're held. The bags are kept in. We work. That's what. That's the complication. The bags are being kept in. Um, they're going to be kept in. Uh, in the community hospitals. So in a like a one in Stratford, one some in um, Leamington, um, and then they're signed in and signed out. Um, as they're used by an individual. I think it would be one of those areas that might be interesting for us to brief all governors on in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As it happens, yeah, yeah. yeah. Certainly, it's been and, worked on. And Sharon, then I'll, I'll just move on to keep the pace going. Yeah, I just wanted to add in um, in in relation to Mary's question. We have uh, two volunteer drivers uh, working in the community in rugby for the end of life palliative care team who uh, drive around picking up prescriptions uh, from different pharmacies to support the families at that crucial time. Um, we are looking to roll out across the whole of Warwickshire um, and the feedback is it is such a, a crucial and very important service to support the families. Uh, thank you Sharon. I think a lot of the problem and this is what I think Emma in particular was referring to is out of hours um, when we can't get into a pharmacy to get things but um, it is great the work that our volunteers do, and it would be super to see that uh, more uh, widely available. Our colleagues have to move on to the falls prevention. Um, so, David, um, verbal update from you. Um, how are things progressing? Um, sorry, the, the meeting was only two days ago, so I wasn't able to put in a report. Um, the figures for April were high. Um, with one severe, that no contributory factor could be found. I mean, my personal view is that they are working very hard with training, literature and so on, but it's not being really reflected in the outcomes. I mean, my, my view, and this is my personal view, is that really it's down to the acuity of the patients being admitted the time of the year, the weather, pandemics, etc. So they could well be worse otherwise, but really is you're never going to get the figure down significantly. Um, they also published a two year um, report which compared 2022-3 to the previous year which was had a lower injury rate but again this could have been down to covid last year we don't that is very likely um the other document that was published was the um due to, due, down to the severity sorry the patient safety incident response report uh, this is fairly lengthy, and if any governors would wish to see this, I can send them a copy of it. Otherwise, happy to take any questions. So thank you, David, and thank you for the balance you, you take on things. I, I'm sure that um, the points you made are, are very valid. I, I recently had a relative on Fairfax uh, Ward, and um, I, I could see where patients were being strongly advised about not getting up on their own, yeah. they were still getting up on their own. So um, it is very difficult for staff. The key thing is we are secure that we're doing everything we can. Um, Sharon, if you could go on to mute, that would be helpful. Um, any questions or perspectives to David? Okie dokie. So thank you, David. Um, we'll move on then to the a patient experience group update and Sharon, now over to you. Yeah, sorry, I, I took the mic, uh, put the mic on in anticipation a little bit early. 
Uh, so following on from the patient experience group meeting that was held on the 20th of April, apologies from Ellie Ward. Uh, the meeting was chaired by Sarah Reynolds, patient experience team manager. First off, the action log and matters arising were reviewed and updated. Sarah Reynolds gave an update on the patient experience group and PALS. Um, the healthcare passport, which I think uh, Fiona mentioned early, earlier, has not yet been agreed. It is in the pipeline to be worked on with suggested amendments. The interpreting service um, at the hospital is being used. Um, in March, the figures for friends and family was 93.4 of people saying they had a good experience with the trust target being 96%. There were 23 formal complaints logged in February and March. The main areas were clinical care, appointments, communication and a small number in maternity. Patient surveys, Beth Goddard um, joined the meeting. Um, didn't uh, actually uh, give a presentation, but they up to, um, announced that an update will be made once a quarter. And at this point, there, there wasn't, um, there weren't any updates because it's been the process of being relaunched and focusing on inpatients and maternity. The AHP update: one person attended from dietetics. Her name was Charlotte. Um, they did say it'd be useful to have more regular attendance from other AHPs. Sarah Reynolds added in that I want great care will be changing to another company which uses electronic devices to send texts and messages to patients for their review. Um, patient forum update, Chris Thornton, the chair, was very sorry to announce the passing of uh, Charles Hart, the former vice chair for many years. Kevin Smith and Michael my sorry, and Michael Piper are covering the role of vice chair at the moment. Chris Thornton is working with Sarah Jane Fraser to arrange for all the patient forum notice boards um, at Warwick, Stratford and Leamington to be updated. Ward accreditations are being carried out throughout the trust and feedback is sent to hotel services and catering. Now my favourite part, volunteer services. Um, an update was given by myself and Denise Phipps. We still have lots of volunteer applications in the pipeline and are in the process of recruiting. We've got volunteers supporting with the rollout of the kiosks in outpatients department to assist with the foot flow. Three uh, breastfeeding peer support volunteers are being recruited in the north of Warwickshire to support breastfeeding um, team in that area. And we've got another lady who's recently joined maternity here at Warwick. We have Sally and Bailey. Bailey's the therapy dog and Sally's is human. Kate and Luna are visiting Warwick Hospital once a week. We are um, looking to recruit more ther therapy dogs. Um, Alison and Bramble visit at Leamington Spa regularly along with um, and along with Kate and Luna have um, won an award at Crufts for their amazing support to the patients and staff here at Swift. Um, we have a fantastic volunteer team at Leamington which sits under the sits with the MDT and is a core cool part of the team there. Volunteers. We are currently looking to review to recruit wayfinding volunteers to um, assist with the whilst the building work is being carried out at Warwick and um, sorry um, to assist whilst the building work is being carried out at Warwick Hospital so that we've got people on the ground actually directing and, and walking people to their appointments if necessary. We're currently looking at um, another sort of high vis type um, um, some sort of uniform for that so that they do stand out as wayfinding volunteers. Um, need to watch the time a bit, Sharon, please. OK, all right. Um, well, I'll move swiftly on. Uh, Jane Downey Legal Services um, introduced herself to the meeting and explained what her role was at SWIFT. Um, Jareth now um, also talked about Ward accreditations, which are known as care excellence. These are taken out by a number of various different people from across the trust. 
Um, Kathy Wagstaff um, from CRU gave a short presentation to highlight the difference between CRU and Falden wards. CRU is for patients who have a brain acquired injury and Falden is part of the stroke pathway. Nigella Dean gave an update on the bedside folder to say that it needs a bit more tweaking and some more work done in it before it's finalised. Kathy asked if it could be shared and amended to uh, suit Leamington. And finally, Maniki Chowan, fundraising manager, um, spoke about the latest fundraising events and that they are looking for volunteers to support um, these events out in the community to raise money for the Swift charity. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Very comprehensive. Uh, questions and perspectives to Sharon? Mike, I think there might be an opportunity for your new Springer to get involved in the Pesticide Therapy Scheme if you want to do your best there. Not sure Springer's the ideal dog for Pesticide Therapy. Far too happy and waggy of tail. Um, Sharon, thank you very much for your hard work. We are very, very blessed to have the volunteers we have. and. Um, we were all saddened at the loss of uh, Charles. A number of us were very close to him and mm -hmm. closely with him for a long, long while. And he was a Ed. great um, ambassador, not just for the patient forum, but for the role of volunteering. Um, Sorry, so Russell. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. It's Kelly. Sorry. A, okay. a, a very quick question to Sharon. Very quick one. Sorry. Yeah, um, up to you, Kelly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, to stay. You talked about plans of the volunteering service to call patients on waiting lists. Is that to, um, what would that mean to tell them that when they're going to be seen or how could they help people on waiting lists? That's that you mentioned. That's something that just that yeah, that is that is something that is being looked at, and it's called waiting well calls. So the idea is is that. Um, we would have a small group of volunteers working with a specialised area, say, for instance, H&R unit, um, and they would call the patient to check where they were on the waiting list. Had they had any problems? Does it need speeding up? Do they need um, any more support whilst waiting? Did they have private treatment and they need to come off the waiting list? So that is something that's been looked at under the umbrella of the health and wellbeing care centres. No, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, apologies, I didn't see any hand raised. Um, thank you, Sharon. And we'll move on then to the Patient uh, Safety Surveillance Committee update. And Sue, over to you. Hello there. Yes, yeah, the report I've got is from the meeting of March. So I'm not sure if that's the one that's already gone out before, um, but I'm happy to go through it. The, the meeting for April and this month were cancelled. Uh, won't keep you a moment. Um, Right, so in fact, this is so. This is a report of the meeting of the sixth of March. Um, uh, the you patient safety. Uh, sorry, so you can uh, and all colleagues, you can take the reports as read. We will have read the report. I, I guess I was pulling. Out I was hoping fingers. you'd say that. It, it's yeah. on, on the whole, it's pretty good. The piece of introduction for the new piece of um, system of, of recording um, was going forward, but was not as fast as being as as they thought it would happen. There were financial implications for training people, and there was going to be a. <laughs> A group of people within this area who were going to be looking at PSERF to see actually how it could be um, implemented and whether we needed to actually retain the data system. But any other questions, please do come back to me. Thank you, Sue. Questions and perspectives, um, Fiona? Yeah, thank, thanks, Sue, for your attendance at that group and uh, uh, apologies that we've had to cancel it a couple of times. Um, just on the back of um, the PSERF, which is Patient Safety Incident Response Framework. It's a national um, uh, new uh, patient safety incident um, strategy. It, it, um, I think it would be helpful for the governors and public to understand in more detail. And, and I'm ha happy for one of my team to, to, do a, to do a presentation on that because it fundamentally changes the approach to investigating um, incidents um, and much more focus on the patient the family, the public engagement in that and asking really telling questions as to why you think it happened to you and how you feel about that. 
Um, we will be recruiting um, some patient safety champions, which will be the members of the public or governors, uh, which we would really help um, uh, uh, us to um, properly embed this very different approach for us. So um, I'm happy to come to a patient care committee probably is the best forum um, to do um, a presentation on that at some point. Thank you, Fiona, for that um, offer. And Russell, could I just, sorry, Russell, it's Sue. I just wanted to say thank you to Fiona. It's lovely to have you back. And you explained that far better than I could or did. Um, <laughs> so thank you. No problem. Thank you, Sue. Any other questions, perspectives on Sue's for update? I guess the one thing, Sue, and this is now directed at Fiona, the one thing that concerned me was the press pressure ulcer um, data. Um, since the, the report's been done and since you're back, uh, Fiona, is there anything on pressure ulcer trends which causes you an anxiety? Um, I am um, asking my team to do a deep dive into the ITU ones. We seem to have had an increase in pressure ulcers in ITU, which is unusual. And I think some commentary that it's not unexpected because of how sick they are. But to me, it should be unexpected. Um, so I, I, I'm asking them the reasons for that and what we need to do to prevent it. Um, but that's the only trend that has been different since I've been away. OK, thank you, Fiona. Please keep us briefed on that because pressure ulcer um, is, is a, a nasty lead indicator if it starts to um, increase. Yeah. OK, team, shall we move on to the safer discharge group update? And uh, Jean? Um, uh, so we had a meeting yesterday. Um, uh, we haven't. We've been meeting every other month. Uh, I missed a few over Christmas. So I'll take it as read the report, but I need to update you. Um, yesterday's meeting was very energised. They were all really keen um, and it was a delight to attend, to be honest. Um, we've just received a, a proposal for a ward technician, a business case, actually in writing. They'd only just received it. And I said it was absolutely brilliant. And then it was pointed out that they didn't actually know um, for sure whether it was two for SWIFT, two technicians for SWIFT, one medical and one surgical, or whether it was one for SWIFT and one for George Elliott. So uh, we will um, make sure that we find out uh, about that. And, um, and obviously we can't wait uh, for the business case to go through and for it to be implemented because the pilot was so successful and it's one of the um, main areas of concern is uh, making sure uh, they had a, they, it wasn't me that mentioned the fire service, they suggested that in October, um, if possible, um, but they can move the month, that we have a board toward discharge event um, and uh, for SWIFT to include the fire service, the four staff, um, emergency department, A&E, whatever the public um, want to call it, uh, and other people um, so that we have a big event about discharge and raise the profile um, of uh, discharge. Um, the respect, sorry, did somebody? No, I just coughed, I apologise. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the respect form, um, they obviously want to try and have a solution because it's not fair that nurses have to keep taking them home and, and the volunteers, etc. So um, they're uh, suggesting what they call an ice bar, which is the integrated care model, where, um, where they have a new flow chart, but more uh, structured and similar to criteria led discharge. So not just nurses responsibility, but also junior doctors and, you know, whoever else. Um, sorry, <laughs> I, I don't get calls. It's a garage. Um, so, uh, sorry, where was I? Um, so, uh, now, aren't you, Jane? Yes, criteria led discharge where the responsibility is shared just one process with shared responsibility to include extra checks and flow charts. We would have had a flow chart available um, to show you, but um, 
uh, due to sickness of the person who's actually done all the work and we haven't yet got that available so it will be um, uh, available and then somebody we talked about olden days and I didn't bring it up first um, where um, we actually have a discharge checklist um, silly as that sounds when we've got all this technology and it was the nurses who talked about it and suggested it and um, they actually go through um, where all the things just before the patient is thinking you know of being discharged that you go through everything with them and one of the nurses said they used to do it on a paper towel um, that they pitched off the wall because it's so important that they actually did do a, a checklist of all sorts of um, things, whether it's jewellery or, you know, how they get, you know, just all the things that um, are necessary. So um, so they they sort of agreed about that, but obviously they'd want to discuss that with, um, uh, with Fiona. But one of the problems about volunteers taking the TTOs um, uh, where they weren't ready at the time is um, sometimes the patients will say, well, what's it for? And will it go with my other patients? And what is this tablet for? And of course they don't know, and it's quite stressful for patients and volunteers. So- um, Watch the time a bit, Jane. Sorry, the checklist will include um, that. Um, they, they were thinking they'd have a big poster on the way out the ward, which also had a list so that that would um, remind them. Uh, so, as I say, it was a really energised and there was a lots of other discussions, a really good meeting um, and I was very impressed. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Jean. And thanks for the work you're doing also on the A&D um, audit. Um, not too sure we need to be going forward with using TOWS as um, a recording mechanism, but that's something <laughs> from the past. Um, any questions or perspectives to Jean on her written report or her verbal update of uh, the meeting this week. Okay, thank you, Jean. So um, we, um, of course, Kim, thank you. And um, we'll move then to the patient portal group update. Um, lots of good work uh, going on here, uh, Roger. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I I uh, produced this because uh, Pat was unable to uh, attend attend the meeting. Um, it's I think self-explanatory. Some of the work will slow down uh, because of the potential delay in moving from Lorenzo to Cerna and the need to have the electronic uh, patient records all in one place at the same time because the feed uh, for the patient portal picks up from our, our records. But um, I leave every, um, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, you may want. Oh, great, thank you, Roger. Thank you for your work on it. The patient portal has been far more popular, I think Glenn will agree with me, than we originally anticipated. Any questions or perspectives to Roger? OK, thank you, Roger. So that nicely segues us into the wayfinding um, strategy group update. Uh, Roger, back with you. Uh, thank you. Um, as um, Glenn and uh, uh, Sarah have already mentioned, work's going on outside. Um, this, of course, messes up the entirety of the signage one way or another. So um, <laughs> there, there is an awful lot of effort that, that is going to go in and um, Sharon's volunteers obviously will be helping. Um, it's, it, it's a matter that will progress uh, slowly as, um, as things physically develop on site. Um, and, and until we've um, trialled the way of uh, getting people around, uh, problems will occur. Uh, I'm sorry, we're working as hard as we can to make sure that there are suitable signs um, and the uh, car parking implications. Um, I think there are some uh, disabled slots that are being moved round simply because the contractors need the uh, current space. So. Um, it is a fluid, fluid thing that everyone will be working hard on. 
happy to take any questions. Thank you, Roger, and thank you for your work on it. It's a very important piece of work and for the future. I'd um, just like to thank uh, Sir John Egan for introducing us and me to Living Map. Uh, Mark Jones and I have had a conversation with them about how digitally we might be able to help the whole issue of getting to the right place in what is not an easy site. Um, any questions uh, to Roger? OK, thank you, Roger. Um, and uh, we'll then move on to the elective care group update. Graham. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you will have had in your pack a very detailed report produced by Mark Jones. Um, I think that gives the detail, I'll take that as read. Um, so that was based on the meeting in March. We've had a meeting in April and there is one due next week. Um, I think one thing that did has come out of this is how complex it is. A number of people have mentioned the noise and what have you, but that's nearly as, not nearly as bad as what people are having to go with, with organising all of this. And um, I take my hat off to them. It's very complex. Um, one of the risks, there is a new risk that's come up. There was an incident um, over a weekend when a contractor was excavating and didn't work to his health and safety plan and managed to hit the gas main. So um, that is being reviewed by the team um, as to how the uh, level of supervision is probably increased at weekends or out of hours. Um, that's all I've got to say on it. It uh, seems to be going in the right direction. Um, at the last meeting, we did see an artist impression of the um, the finished building, which um, I'll make sure comes to the group next time. Thank you very much, Graham. A question, some perspectives, and Mike. It's um, just a comment, really. The um, on sustainability, the Briam Excellent target is a very tough ask, and uh, but I do assume that once it's sorted for the elective hub. It will be useful in terms of taking forward Briam sustainability um, issues for the next phases of the hospital development. Graham, I th we'll be able to carry some of that forward, I hope. I it's I'll, pretty difficult. Yeah, I, uh, yes, I appreciate that, whether it's bat boxes or collecting waste water. But um, in order to get the business case through, um, you do have to achieve that Bream excellent and that will fit in with the sustainability going forward. It's really not easy. Been there twice. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And uh, Roger? Uh, I think I'd like to congratulate uh, Warwick District Council by uh, by Kerosene for being able to del deliver the planning permission uh, in, in double quick time. Thinking of all the uh, hassle that we had in delivering planning permission for the car park. Um, Graham and and uh, the team and Mark Jones, etc., have done extraordinarily well in getting it through as quickly. So um, well done. Well said, Roger. Thank yeah, you. Well said. And uh, thanks to all the executive team who are, uh, are making the hard work happen. Um, colleagues, happy to move on. So just a few governance matters, which I'll try and rattle us through. The first is the minutes of the Patient Care Committee from the 13th of March, which will take us red. Um, Jean, anything you wanted to add to those? Really, the, I did do a proper report, but the minutes are much more up to date because of um, various reasons. Um, so no, um, anything they want to know, but yeah. OK, thank you. And uh, just for clarification, so correct me if I'm wrong, these are just for noting, not for approval. That's correct, Russell. Thank you. We've then got uh, for noting the GPC approved minutes from the extraordinary meeting held on the 14th of March and draft minutes from the meeting held on the 13th of April. Um, Mary, anything you wanted to add to these? You know, take, take them as read. Just to explain, the extraordinary meeting was necessary because we had to fit in with the um, timing of the round table. We, ha we needed to have a discussion about the round table agenda and we wanted to approve um, Mike as a member of the group so he could attend more quickly. And we had some urgent training issues that we needed to resolve. Um, but then the, the ordinary meeting just covered the ordinary uh, topics that we always have to cover. Um, there's one thing that um, the chair asked that, that if governors are sitting on groups or committees that are not happening, could they let the chair know? 
um, and then he could he'd like to know what's what's happening because we've had a lot of meetings cancelled, understandably, possibly recently because of the pressures. But um, but uh, the chair asked me to uh, to remind governors to let him know. Um, we discussed the membership engagement committee and the terms of reference of the GPC, which we're coming on to later. And we confirmed Carolyn as a member of the Radiation Protection Committee with Callie as a deputy. That's that's all I need to put out, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or perspectives to Mary? OK, thank you, Mary, and uh, your hard work as lead governor. And so we've got a report on resignation and appointment of uh, governors. Um, Sarah Clett. Thank you. So since my last report, um, Dr. Bernard Usselman has been elected as a staff governor for the medical and dental category. We do still have a vacancy for the staff governor in the nursing and midwifery community, which um, we will go out to for an election process in due course. I'd just like to note under this item that due to the recent local um, elections, we may have a change to the three appointed governors from our local councils. Decisions will be made by each of the organisations at their full council meetings this month, which then I'll be informed of um, the representatives who will be then our appointed governors. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I'd just like to thank those um, stakeholder governors who may no longer be working with us going forward for their hard work over the years. Um, questions and perspectives to Sarah, Mary? Um, just to say that we all need to have some kind of in, induction in place for the, if there are new appointed governors. So um, we'll have to, to look at that at uh, general purposes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, team, so we'll move on then, I think, to the um, draft quality report for 22-23. Uh, we'll take this as read, Fiona, but anything you particularly like to point out? Um, no, just the purpose of it coming here really is to um, receive comments from um, the governors, particularly on the contents of it. We do have a lot more freedom with the um, quality um, uh, report now, post COVID really. We don't, it's not, there, there isn't as many mandated fields. In fact, it's not mandated to um, publish a quality report at all um, and several organisations decided not to but we have continued but we have made it much more succinct and taken out some of the mandated fields which really didn't reflect um, the quality of our services um, as, as best we could but we do have freedom to add things in if you think that anything is missing or, or want to send me any comments um, it will go for approval to June uh, audit committee and then July board so you've got that sort of time frame um, if people want to send me anything. Yeah, can I suggest the way we handle this um, is that if you do have any feedback on the report, you sort of email Fiona directly. Um, and uh, and uh, can I suggest you do that by the end of next week, because June will be on us uh, faster than you think. Um, any other questions or perspectives, Mike? Um, just a quick one. I think it reads very well, actually. It's rather good. Um, just a question, when, when will it go to Health Watch with my other hat on um, for them to review and comment on it for your um, Annex 1? I think, and I, I, I might need to be corrected, Mike, but I think it came here first and then it goes to external partners. So it was it was coming to our internal sort of uh, governor um, uh, um, for, for comment first and then it goes to them. So I think in the next week or two. Thank you very much. OK. OK, so um, until uh, Friday week to give feedback to Fiona, I'll forever hold your peace. Thank you um, to the team who have produced that, Fiona. Um, can you pass uh, thanks back to them? Yeah. Then we've got the Register of Governors um, and Governors' Interests Annual Review. Uh, Sarah, back with you. Thank you, Russell. So just to note the earlier comment around Pat Scott's updated interest that a grandson is a physiotherapist at the Trust and granddaughter is primary care network manager in Coventry. And obviously the registers will also be or may also be affected by the appointed governors once we've been notified of the representatives from our local councils. So I'm proposing that although these are published on the website, that until we've got the confirmation of the appointed governors, I will 
postpone publishing them for the time being. So mm -hmm. these are for um, receiving and noting with those caveats. Thank you. Thank you. So any questions or perspectives? Um, just a couple of points from me. Um, I, I would always counsel um, governors, as I do myself, to um, uh, fully declare any interest they have, any business interests um, that they have, um, because then it's just a matter of public record and you don't have to worry about any item coming up needing to declare stuff. So um, um, I, I'm surprised just with um, some governors that uh, a few nothing to declare as well. I thought um, you, you would have had um, a business interests or other interests elsewhere. So I leave that with you. My, my second observation is um, it is for some strange reason a uh, obligation on governors to declare their, um, I was going to say allegiance, but their membership of any political party. That, that doesn't hold for non-executive directors, which I often find a bit strange, but just for the avoidance of doubt, I am not a member of any uh, political party. Um, uh, nor have I been. I was for a short period of about three months a member of the Communist Party at the age of 19 as an enthusiastic um, young student at the age of 19. But um, I met some of my fellow members and decided shortly after that a pint of Guinness was probably a better thing to do on a Friday evening. Um, but I'm not a member, nor have I been of any political party, just for your interest. Um, but I would encourage non-executive directors in their declarations of interest, if they are a member, albeit you're not expected to, I just think it's polite to governors, as they are expected to uh, mention if you're a member of a um, political party. Um, any other questions on the um, governor's interests? Um, and so we'll move on to the membership and engagement committee. Sue. Over to you. Hello. Thank you, Russell. Um, I'll take the report as read, but I just want to pick out a couple of key points. Um, governors were asked to submit expressions of interest in joining the new membership and engagement committee, but unfortunately there were insufficient numbers to meet the membership requirements as set in the first draft of the terms of reference. So at the General Purposes Committee, they therefore agreed some amendments to the terms of reference so that the establishment of the membership and engagement committee could be recommended to the council for approval today and those terms of reference are attached to the report um, and it should be noted that subject to the council's approval today the responsibility for membership and engagement will no longer fall to the general purposes committee so the um, next item of business on today's agenda will be to consider an amendment to the general purposes committee terms of reference i'm not sure if mary wanted to add something at this point that was very clear. Thank you. Um, Mary? Yes, yes, I would. Uh, yes, as uh, Sue just said, when we um, asked for expressions of interest to be on this committee, we only had three governors. So I would like to encourage, um, we've uh, made the um, terms of reference quorum three to allow it to meet. But we would we would like more governors on board. We would like um, any any type of governor. Particularly, we'd like to encourage once we've established who the new uh, who the governors are going to be from the local authority, we would like to encourage an appointed governor from local authority because we think it would be very useful to link in with the engagement activity of of, of the councils. Um, so um, once we once we know who they are, we'll perhaps write to them individually and ask if one of them would like to step forward. But equally, any other governors would like to make this committee a bit more robust um, if if we can persuade anybody. Um, yeah, I think just just to reinforce what Mary said, uh, th this committee is actually a key responsibility of the governors. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would really encourage uh, governors, I know a number of you are busy, a number, a number of you do different stuff, really important stuff. And some of it I know is very interesting and you find it very educational. But th this committee actually has important governor work to do. So if I can encourage governors um, to join the committee, I would be grateful. I appreciate those who have volunteered already. Um, I think it's so important, Russell, to add that um, it's all, we want all governors to get involved at some stage in the activities that are arranged by this group. 
but this is the group that's going to sort of steer the agenda. And I'm stepping back from that because I can't take on any more. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Mary. Um, so uh, uh, if you're not happy to approve these terms of reference, could you please raise a digital hand? Can you take your digital hand down, Mary? Sorry, just wanted to add that um, the first meeting of this group is the 31st of May and the committee, sorry, and they will perhaps want to look at the terms of reference again. I think Mike and Roger have done some work on particularly Mike, so um, they can take them away and the committee can bring them back to the next Council of Governors if they want to make any more changes. As to reserve as such, thank you, Mary. Can you take that's perfect. So, um, if you're not happy to approve the establishment of the committee in its term of reference, could you please raise a digital hand? Duly approved. And I think on the next one, if I can just help on this, um, Sarah, it's just that simple amend, isn't it? So yes. amending the um, terms of reference of the GPC to reflect the establishment of the um, membership and engagement committee. If you're not happy to approve the adjustment of the terms of reference of the GPC, could you please raise a digital hand? So they're duly approved as well. Thank you. We're then on to the annual review of board standing orders. Sarah? Thank you, Russell. Um, so the board standing orders have been reviewed by audit committee and also through the board. And because this is part of the constitution requires Council of Governors approval, there are actually no amendments being proposed, but they're here um, for Council of Governors consideration as to whether there's any um, amendments to be made this year. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so the annual review of board standing orders, any questions or perspectives? If you're not happy to approve them, could you please raise a digital hand? OK, thank you, duly approved. Um, and then the update on NHS England's publications. Back with you, Sarah. Thank you, Russell. So um, the report outlines recent publications from NHS England, which I felt the governors needed to be aware of. It includes brief overview of each of the new publications together with hyperlinks so that you can access them and read them in more detail if you wish. So happy to take the report as read and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions or perspectives to Sarah? OK, Julie noted. Thank you. And then the Council of Governors schedule. Blah, blah, blah. Council of Governors schedule of business um, for the year ahead. So thank you. We're so happy to take it as read. Um, it's for the Council of Governors to approve. So if there's any um, amendments that we know of at this stage, but obviously we can adjust the schedule as we go through. Thank you. GPC does that. Um, any questions on that schedule of business? If you're not happy to approve, could you please raise a digital hand? OK, duly approved. So I think we're on to any other business team. Any other business, please raise a digital hand before we go to the confidential section. Um, I don't believe we've got any mem Oh, I apologise, Fiona. Fiona? Sorry, I was late raising it. Can I just remind all governors and public to have their spring vaccines if they are eligible? Thank you. Thumbs up going around. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and uh, have we had any hands back up, Fiona? Okay. Um, and do we have any questions from members of the public, Sarah? We haven't, but still no. Um, I can't see any members of the public on the line, but if there are members of the public on the line who'd like to ask a question, could you please raise a digital hand? OK, just for members of the public who in the future may be watching this, um, if you do want to ask a question, um, please do not hesitate to email me at SWIFT and I will endeavour to answer it. Um, all questions are always welcome. Um, we will therefore um, adjourn to discuss matters of a confidential nature. But can I suggest we have a 10 minute comfort break, get back together again at four, um, and then we will go on to the confidential section. Thank you very much, and I will see you in 10 minutes. Take care.